That's really bad. Good morning, everyone. I hope we are all having a very, very lovely Thursday morning. My name is Jay Wilson, and I'm with Big Brothers Big Sisters. And I am here today to welcome you to our exhibit for today's uh, Discovery Festival exhibition. We have the dynamic duo, Dr. Curtis O'Malley and Thomas Godman with New Mexico Tech, and they will be sharing on the wondrous explorations of the physics of battle bots. And so with that introduction, I will go on ahead and allow both Thomas and Curtis to uh, get their exhibit started. Thank you. So uh, I should be sharing my screen now. Do you want me to share my video too or no? Uh, absolutely, by all means, go on ahead. It says I can't. And it says the host has stopped video sharing. All right, well, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started while we look at that. But uh, so I'm Dr. Malley. I'm a faculty member here at New Mexico Tech. Um, I'm a faculty member specifically in the mechanical engineering department. So just this last weekend, we had our, our robot combat tournament where seniors competed against each other for their senior design project. 
but we also had groups from middle schools and high schools from around the state come and bring bots and compete alongside them in uh, their own uh, sixth through 12th grade weight class. Um, I've got a couple of students' names up here, Mason, Jet, and Noah, who have been really instrumental in getting the program running. And so what BattleBots is, we've got various weight classes of robots. The primary ones that the students here build are either 150 gram ant weight or a three pound beetle weight. And they can get extra weight into their class for various other reasons if they design a, a robot that isn't wheel driven, right? That has legs and walks or uh, get some, some weight bonuses from those kind of things. But I'd like to start off with, I've got a couple of videos here from last spring. So this was our first tournament. And this is just a video that was produced by some of the students here in mechanical engineering. There we go, video is up and running. So, hello. Uh, this is one of their robots, Ice Cream Slamwich, that they built last April. They've got this little video, it takes the part, the robot shows you the exploded view, shows you all the pieces, and then ends with some little excerpts of last April's competition. Uh, I usually get the question, and please chime in in the chat, or if you have questions, but how do you win? Right? What constitutes winning? So easy answer to that is if you make it so the other robot can't compete. The other answer would be, you some sort of scoring system, right? And not some sort of scoring system, but the scoring system. You can score points for causing damage, uh, disabling parts of the other robot, being more aggressive, getting hits, pinning the robot, all those kinds of things. Um, so here the video is about to get good. start to lose some pieces and then rip off the whole front end of the other robot. So, um, you know, we learn a little bit about how to design them better each time we do it and, and get a little better each time. So you'll see some of the same robots appear again and again, and some of them that just didn't work at all, we'll scrap it and start over. Uh, and that would be a win. Not only did I break it, uh, but I knocked it up on its end and it couldn't move anymore. The other video we got here is from a second senior design team. You saw some of the action of their robot against the other one in the first video. There's highlights a little bit more about who the team members were, and what they designed. All of this is up on the uh, mechanical Engineering at New Mexico Tech YouTube site. You can go and watch the audio without me voicing over everything. Um, yeah. All right, so we've got, again, same setup here, they, they take a SOLIDWORKS model and they start to explode out the pieces to look at all the major components, how they designed it all to fit together, right? Modern engineering will do a lot with designing everything before we put the first parts together to make sure it fits. I, I remember an old documentary on um, Boeing aircraft, you know, they used to be designed on paper and right, you start to put it together and there wouldn't be places for everything. And then some of the newer aircraft, they, completely design and assemble the craft in the computer. That way everything fits exactly where it's supposed to the first time they go to put it together on the assembly floor. And that's really our goal here. We're not gonna waste our time later. We're gonna design it and put it all together. All right, so I'll jump over to that, that site because the 
video I don't have in our slides yet is from this past Saturday. We had a tournament and I'll skip ahead. Like I said, it was just this past Saturday, so I don't have the video edited down to bite-sized pieces yet. But these are those little robots, the 150 grams, chasing each other around the arena. The arena you actually see behind me. Um, I'll pull the camera over there uh, if we've got time and, and show some of this live instead of the videos. <coughs> But the other one I have over to my left is a uh, arena we have for laser tag robots. So the freshmen here design laser tag robots, the seniors design battle bots, and the seniors and I, and the freshmen for that matter, help run training classes for middle school and high school teachers, educators, um, and actually help teach them in the classroom too. So you see here, with the green one pinned it, so that would be a knockout. You know, we were interested in having fun, so he actually, in a minute here, knocks him over so we can keep going and uh, have not quite so short of a match. We got, so. we got a couple questions that came in, and one of them has to do with knockouts. Uh, what's the point system that you guys use in BattleBots? So I'm going to let Thomas take that one because he is actually one of the judges Saturday. Yeah, so I actually judged our last robot combat competition. And so we have a three prong scoring system. We judge it based on how aggressive the robot is. We judge it based on how much damage the robot does. And we judge it how much on how much they control the match. So we give each robot a score of, we give both robots a combined score of 17 total points. There's five points you can get for being aggressive. If you're going after a robot, you're attacking them, you're getting hits in, well, you're more likely to get a higher score for your aggression. If you happen to, you know, pin your other robot, uh, your competitor against the wall, well, we're going to give you a little bit higher score for your control. You managed to, you know, make sure that you had control of the match. You weren't letting them get any good hits in. You were keeping them pinned back. Um, so you can get a total of six points for control. And then damage, we actually examine the robots after the match ends and we say, okay, this one lost its weapon. This one has all sorts of crazy gashes on it. Uh, we're going to say the one that lost its weapon probably took a little bit more damage and will once again score that out of six. So most matches end, you know, 10-7 if there's not a whole lot of damage done. You can be scored a total knockout where the robot just doesn't work anymore. Or if you lose your weapon, you're probably not going to do very well when it comes to scoring the competition. Okay. Uh -huh. And so the other one was, was what, how did the BattleBots program get started with you all uh, at New Mexico Tech? That's a great question. So it got started, I had seniors about four years ago that went to a competition in Texas and they, as their senior design project, and they came back and they were really excited. I asked them, why'd you go all the way to Texas? It's like, because it was either Texas or Denver. And so my answer to that was what you see behind me, what you see on the screen. Now it's not only in Texas, it's Denver, it's here in New Mexico. Um, so the student interest it essentially drove the program and we followed their interest and came up with a, a way to do it here in Socorro. And we've been up to Albuquerque to do it at the Explora. Um, Hopefully in the future, Big Brothers Big Sisters has Discovery Festival in person again, and we bring it up there to show you guys in person. Um, but yeah, again, this is some of the bigger robots. Um, including the Morgrim, who is the one that keeps jumping around. Uh, he's got a, a blade that that spins that has a knob on it, but only on one side. So it's unbalanced. And so he actually, you know, gets the robot kind of airborne when he goes to attack. It's kind of interesting. Um, but anyway, did you have other questions too? We got one. So, uh, so usually speaking, when you do have your, your battle bot competitions, 
Uh, how many students participate and how often do they, do they battle? So it's double elimination tournaments. Um, we had Saturday, we had 16 robots. Oh, that was fun. Um, there were eight from New Mexico Tech that competed against each other in those two weight classes. And then I had eight that will, were built by students from Roswell that drove up for the weekend. Um, they, had, they built them in teams of about eight students. So we had 75 students from Roswell bring up eight robots. Um, like I said, double elimination tournament. So we set it up, a new match starts about every five minutes um, and you know, goes until we have a bracket winner. Uh, sort of like March Madness, except you get a chance to come back if you lose one. So I, I like this match in particular, and I, I really like that new robot, Morgan. But I'm going to jump ahead here in the video to where the middle schooler started. Somewhere in here after lunch. There we go. So with the middle school students, we little box that look a little more like this. We got foam core board, cardboard, uh, to build yourself a frame. We've got an Arduino computer that controls it. And so we'll teach the students over the course of about four weeks how to code the Arduino and tell it how to in interpret signal from the transmitter receiver, your controller. So we'll interpret the signal here from the controller, tell it the drive motors, how to go, um, how to turn left, how to turn right, forward, reverse. Um, so there's We've got to go over um, analog versus digital signal types. Uh, there's a little bit of algebra to process the signal because your standard RC controller is built to, to drive an RC car that has two drive motors in the back and a steering servo that turns the front wheels. You notice we don't have that. We have two wheels, we have two drive wheels. So we control left and right with sending more or less power to one wheel or the other or switching the direction. Um, so we have to go over this different signal types and how we can tell it to switch the direction, right? I can't send a negative power signal to my motors. I have to actually have to switch the system around and change the input and the output pin for the power, right? So the positive and the negative uh, rather than sending a negative value. So all of that is what, what we go through in that program. All right, so we've got several more hours here. I'm not gonna let, uh, not gonna have you watch uh, of their bots going. And so Curtis, we had another question that just came in. So as far as the components uh, that the kids are able to use with their, with their battle bots, do, you, do they have a preset already made kind of uh, listing of materials or can they just kind of make their own materials? So the schools that have reached out to me so far, um, I've got a list of about $100 worth of parts that'll build a basic robot, give you a couple extra motors to, um, go and attach a weapon, uh, a spinning device like that. So the ones that you saw there from the middle school, I started with working with them in October. We had them at the competition in November. They didn't have spinning weapons or anything yet. So they, they basically built a, like a shark and a, a, looked like a jousting robot. You know, they got a shish kebab stick sticking off the end of it. It'll Pierce, the other guy. Um, so they, they came up with really creative. They were really excited to come and get started, even though we hadn't gotten far enough in the program to start adding weapons yet. Um, 
But that said, it doesn't have to stay at that. That hundred dollars worth of stuff is the Arduino, the wiring, the batteries, the motors, uh, the controller. Actually, the single most expensive thing is probably the controller. Um, you know, and then from there, you we, you've got something running. A lot of what we do in engineering is we design it, we evaluate it, and like I said, with the bigger robots, we test it and we see what worked, what didn't, and we look to improve it. So. Um, you know, where you go from there, that first one is where your imagination takes you. And so when it comes to the weapons, are there any, is there anything that's off limits? Like, can you add a flamethrower to one or? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so here in, at New Mexico Tech, we actually have a degree in explosives engineering. You cannot put explosives on your robot. You can't put a flamethrower on your robot because it will melt my cage. Um, you can put magnets on it to get it to grip the floor so that Morgan, when it spins its weapon, it doesn't go flying. It can actually deliver the hit to the other bot. Um, I, I don't want any projectile weapons. Um, those are my three. Oh, one more thing. Uh, no directed energy weapons. A directed energy weapon is something that takes a huge current and tries to send it out as like a microwave signal and fry the other thing. So all of my rules of things that you can't have are based around uh, the risk to the spectator, right? No flamethrower, no projectile weapons, no uh, no explosives and no directed energy because all of those things could damage somebody. Somebody. Um, yeah. Uh, other than that, m most of it's fair game, right? Spinning hammer. Um, the the wedge is a very passive weapon, but is actually pretty effective uh, when done well. Um, Yeah, there's also, I, I haven't seen them here in our competition yet, but there's lots of uh, flipping type weapons that you go and you get under it and try and throw the other robot. Um, you know, all of those kind of things are, are where we're at with it right now. Maybe in the future we'll add flamethrowers as a possibility. I need a different arena for that. But okay, so yeah, it. I you guys got to how it started, or you already asked me. It it all started with the students, the student interest, the interest I saw from middle school and high school teachers, and um, and, and we went from there. And so this little white one here is the first prototype. I had a freshman work with me after the end of their freshman intro to engineering class. We came up with the bot. Um, the first one was 3D printed. We realized that you, with the 3D printed frame in this little wedge design, they can't actually do anything to each other. It's a little too heavy to move around effectively. Um, so we, we switched over to the foam core board is much easier, more versatile, um, and get a lot more schools and programs involved with it. So we'll stick with that for now um, and get them started and then they can you know, like we said, go from there, design bigger and better. I talked a bit about signals. Um, this, so this is the path, and this is where we have to start with starting to design our system. I've got that controller that sends out a steering and throttle signal. It sends it out as a wave. Like, just like what's happening now with all, anybody that's watching on Wi-Fi, right? You've got a wireless signal coming in to your computer and your computer processing it and turning it into our video and audio. Well, so the controller does the same thing. It sends out this wire, uh, wireless signal as a PWM wave. The transmitter is in the controller that sends it out as 
Well, so actually it doesn't send the, the PWM wave doesn't go out. The PWM wave is what the dial here creates. It sends it to the transmitter that sends it out as that 2.4 gigahertz PPM signal, which is analogous to your Wi-Fi signal. The receiver gets it, converts it back to PWM, but because we're not using it to control a steering wheel on our robot, we need that Arduino piece in there. And so we've got to convert it into a microsecond signal. So short bursts of signal that do individual channels that we can uh, analyze separately and convert them into the signal that we'll send to the motor driver. So all of this is what we'll talk through in, in a class setting um, and, and go through and develop some code for it. I'm just picking uh, for here today a couple of of slides from the from the educational program. So this one is just explaining what I was talking about. We've got the drive motor in the back and the steering rack and pinion in the front that's controlling the steering wheel um, versus ours has two drive motors. So it's the the big difference between the two different setups. And and how we go about doing that. So with that, I think I'll I'll stop there for a minute. And if there's no more questions for me, I'll let Thomas take over and show some of the physics behind what we're doing. And I'll go set up the arena to uh, drive something around in it. Thanks, Curtis. So if you could, yeah, stop sharing your screen for now. Um, I can take it away with video. Um, let me switch my video over to, let's see, that, let's see. Ah, cool. So let's see, ah, let's take, get rid of my background. Uh, let's go background, None. Okay, so we've got this uh, setup over here. Uh, my name is Thomas Godden. I'm a graduate student in physics. I'm not actually an engineer like Dr. O'Malley. So I'm gonna do a couple of demonstrations relating to the physics you might see in a BattleBots arena, or that if an engineering student came to one of my classes, I might be able to help them learn some of the theoretical aspects of what they're seeing when they go into the arena. So we first wanna talk about sort of defensive positioning of the BattleBots. Um, so we're gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about how a battle bot can defend itself, how it can build itself to be a little bit better defensive structure. So the first thing I have here is a very simple thing. It's just one individual thumbtack. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to see how a balloon holds up when I can apply a little bit of force onto this thumbtack. So I have a balloon here. I'm going to try and put it down onto this thumbtack and see what happens. It immediately, which is what we would expect, head of a thumb tack, which is causing a whole lot of pressure to be applied to that balloon. It immediately breaks it. So what I want to do is I want to run a little demonstration to see what would happen if instead of one thumb tack, we got out a bunch of thumb tacks. So I actually have here a setup that has about 50 thumb tacks in it that are all pressed into this piece of cardboard. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to push a balloon down onto this cardboard to see what happens. Now our logic says that the same thing's gonna happen. We're going to push balloon down onto something sharp and so it's gonna explode. So let's test that out. I've got another balloon here that I haven't popped yet. I'm gonna push it down onto this thumbtacks. And surprisingly, the balloon can be pushed down really hard and it doesn't actually blow up. And that's because there are just so many thumbtacks there. We are actually working with a whole lot of area that all that force that I'm putting down onto the balloon is being spread out over each one of these individual pinpoints. And so while the force I'm applying to the balloon is really high, the pressure of what the balloon's experiencing is actually really low. And so because I have so many individual little sharp points, they're actually working together to protect the balloon. And we can see that this isn't just me gently pressing down. If I were to get a really heavy physics textbook and I were to put it down on my balloon and push down, 
the same thing happens. We don't have, even though we increase the force, we still have enough area underneath us of sharp objects that they're causing a very low amount of pressure to be applied to the balloon, keeping it nice and safe. We can do this even further by putting this down and I even just smack it really hard, really protecting it, which is really, really cool. So if we actually have a robot that wants to sort of use this concept, we don't want a robot to be built with one little tiny structural thing like an individual thumbtack or a small little piece of 3 printed or metal you know, contraption keeping all, everything safe. We wanna have all these tiny little pieces that are going to sort of spread all the force that an opposing weapon attacks it with out over a very large area in order to keep our robot safe. So if I had a physics or uh, engineering student come to my physics class, this is a demonstration I might do with them to work on sort of helping them design a really nice safe battle bot that's gonna take a lot for it to be destroyed. So we have a couple other demonstrations that we're gonna do today besides just our small bed of nails here. This platform that I've got everything on actually rotates. And a lot of our weapons that we see in our battle bot competitions are rotating weapons. So we're gonna explore exactly what type of rotating weapon is best. Let me pull this back a little bit so that I have room to spin and I'll change the camera angle so that you guys can see me. Um, so we see a lot of different rotating weapons. Some rotating weapons are big. They have uh, large sort of hammers on the edge of them. Other the rotating weapons are smaller there's in a battle box competition so what i've done here is i've built my got myself a rotating platform that spins and we're going to see how fast i can spin with my weights distributed in different ways so i have these really nice heavy weights for with me that i'm gonna sit here and hold on to so if i spin myself around you can see that i go pretty fast but when i pull my arms out I actually slow down, my rotation stops. I've actually shifted the way that my weight is distributed and all of a sudden I can't spin as fast because my arms are out with pretty heavy weights in them. But if I decide to pull my arms back in, I start spinning really fast again because I've got all that weight tucked right up against me. It's easier for my body to spin around and go a lot faster. So we see that this is a very helpful thing if a student is trying to build a really heavy weapon that might take them a little bit to get that weapon charged up. They might get attacked by something that can move a little bit faster. And so if I were to have a physics student who was interested in building a battle bot, I might say that a saw is a much better weapon to use because it's going to go a lot faster and maybe be able to do a lot more damage because you can get it spinning up faster really quickly instead of something maybe like a big hammer that's going to take a long time to get spun up before it can actually hit something really hard. Now, Dr. O'Malley showed videos of our new favorite bot, Morgrim, spinning here. And well, Morgrim is a really cool bot because it spins so crazily and it can flip itself over. And it does that because of a cool concept in physics called momentum. Because it's spinning around, it wants to stay pointing straight up all the time. the wheel is causing it to fight gravity. The same thing wants to keep that robot pointing up right. And if something hits it, well, it's gonna cause it to flip over so it can keep spinning instead of you know just stopping spinning. So we can see that in our with this next demonstration here as well, where if I take this, if I start myself spinning with the bicycle wheel going, I can then use the bicycle wheel spinning to control how fast I spin on the platform. So if I get myself spinning really fast, and I try and turn that bicycle wheel over, it gets me spinning even faster. Let's try that again. Where if I spin this thing even faster and start myself spinning, by turning that bicycle wheel over, it's gonna cause me to keep going, spinning even faster and faster and faster to try and keep itself the same. The momentum of the bicycle wheel actually by flipping it over, it changes and it causes me to change how fast I'm rotating. When we see that in a bot like Morgrim, we don't see the bot start, start rotating faster. Instead, it flips upside down. So if I were to sort of have a student who was building a bot like that, I might tell them that you need to take this account into a, this sort of effect into account 
Otherwise, you might be in trouble and you might have a hard time attacking your opponent instead of doing crazy flips around the arena, even though it does look really cool. So these are two big demonstrations that I think are important to the physics of what these battle bots do. I do have a third demonstration that's sort of not based on the bots that we see in action, but a theoretical third type of weapon that I've been thinking about a lot. I think the idea of having a battle bot that had a wrecking ball on it would be really, really cool. And so I have designed an experiment here with a theoretical wrecking ball that we have over here. You might be able to see it off there. This is my bowling ball pendulum. So this is a giant bowling ball that is strapped onto the rugby goalpost here at New Mexico Tech and free to swing. So if I pick it up, then while we're doing, I'm, I'm giving energy to this bowling ball. I'm sort of taking it away from where gravity wants it to be as close to the ground as it can be. And when I let it go, well, gravity is going to pull it back to the ground and cause it to swing back and forth. If we were to design this in a battle bot, well, then we would be able to sort of swing our battle bot and cause it that give our bowling ball some motion and cause it to attack the other bowling ball or the other battle bot. Well, this is a really cool idea to me because well, we can use this some physics to predict exactly how this battle bot uh, or wrecking ball would behave. So we know that we give it some sort of energy by swinging it, and by the time we let it go and it gets all the way back down here, it's traveling really fast. So if we can get it to hit a battle bot right there. Well, it's going to be able to do a whole lot of damage. We have an experiment, though, that can sort of help us protect our battle bot if we're going to use something like this theoretical bowling ball or wrecking ball type contraption. We know because more energy, and so we want to know how we can protect our battle bot from hitting ourselves again. We don't want to swing it and it come back and hit us and do more damage than we did to our opponent. So. We know that from physics, we, if I pull a bowling ball up to the same height, or to some height, then it shouldn't be able to ever get, and we're going to test that out here today. I'm going to pull this bowling ball all the way up to my nose. And well, if physics is right, this bowling ball can't actually hit me in the face because I'm not going to give it more energy than just this, than just this height that it can travel to. It can never swing up any higher than this. If physics is wrong, though, my theoretical weapon doesn't work, well, then I might need to go to the nurse after this. So let's hope that physics is right here and that everything goes according to plan. And physics works. So we see that even though I dropped it very close to my face, it swings up and never gets back to that same height because it doesn't have enough energy to swing back and hit me in the face. This is sort of the same thing we would see if we were to put this onto a battle bot and sort of try and use this to attack our opponents. If we swung it to just outside our own bot and went after our opponent, we could never hurt ourselves. We'd only be doing damage to our opponent. And with that, those are my three demonstrations on battle bots there. Dr. O'Malley, if you're ready for driving your robots in the arena, I think we can hand it back over to you. Yeah, sounds good. Can you still hear me okay? Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Still hear you, Dr. O'Malley? All right. I got two uh, two cameras going, one way back there. So, um, yeah, so this one is Goomba. It's the winner from last April. And also the, uh, the bot that I built to compete against my students. So I did not win more than... Um, yeah, more than one this year. Oh, and I already broke my phone. <laughs> so it, it has some battle elements. Including the fact that one of the wheels doesn't like to stay on anymore. But I got it in here with one of the middle school design. You can see the clear difference in power, right? The middle school one just isn't going to push the big one, even missing a wheel. Although I should be able to see it. Oh, yeah.
So, um, a little bit of a line. <laughs> If we can get the other one back. Yeah. This one's actually nice. You can it's it's well organized in here. We can see all of the components. So I've got the two Arduino drive motors, I've got the receiver here in the bottom. I dumped everything else out. <laughs> it was organized nicely. Um, the Arduino, which makes up our brain of the robot. I've got a, the red device here is the eighth bridge. That's what sends the actual power to the motors. And one of our most important parts, because some of what we do is inherently a little dangerous, right? So safety is important. All the robots have are required to have a single on-off switch. So this power supply here has this button. Everything lights up when I push the button, goes off when I when I push it. Um, we always load the arenas with the most dangerous robot, most dangerous in terms of the one with highest potential to cause harm um, lap, uh, last. So the least dangerous first, the most dangerous last, you know, and, and turn them on in that order so that everything's closed up as soon as the bots are live. Um, so, so Dr. Mali, we had a question that came in from, uh, from one of our students of Zabing. Uh, what is the most innovative design that you've seen for a for, for BattleBot? Most innovative design. All of them. They're very small and they're very fast. And they have to be very great to describe. All right, so I've got a guest in here. Uh, Jet is one of my students. Oh, yeah, you can come over here so I don't have to turn the camera quite so far. Um, and so, yeah, what he was saying was the most innovative are the 150 gram robots. The weight is so important. If you think about it, 150 grams is really very little. So, um, they actually um, have the weight found over there. Yeah. Um, actually, yeah, to give it an idea, this is the 150 grams right here of just weights. So that's 150 grams of brass. The whole robot has to weigh less than that. Um, and so they came up with things like they had a tiny little motor that spin a little piece of steel, no bigger than a paper clip, but you know, more robust than a paper clip. They tried to chip little pieces off the other thing. Kind of like a, it sounds like a tiny little Dremel tool. It's, it's gonna try and chip away at the other robot. They also had one that had the 3D printed hammer with a needle on it as a stinger to try and, you know, like smash through the top of the other robot. Um, but it, it takes a lot of engineering to come up with a way to make anything work at that small of a scale. So another question that we got was, um, what, what are the characteristics um, of a winning battle bot? Or, or what, what are some of the characteristics that they tend to have? Characteristics of a winning battle bot. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Maneuverability. Uh, generally speaking, the faster robot that can turn and steer and direct itself um, that's how the one Doombot that I had in here won last year, it was faster. It, the others couldn't hit it, um, and it had the time and the speed to come around and, and come at them from the other side where they didn't have a weapon. Um, the, 
I would say that's pretty pretty universal to all the ones in all the weight classes that were the winners. The one that's the better able to move around the arena um, has the better chance. Obviously, the skill of the driver has something to do with it, and you know, and, and the and the weapons and other things play into it. But to give yourself the best chance, make it maneuverable. Um, they also found that you know, steel plate is rather slick. The, the arena floor is just the steel plate. Um, so if they had really slick wheels, they didn't grip it. They didn't go anywhere. They spun really fast, and nothing happened. Um, which is a, a great, interesting design problem, right? We had to, they essentially had to fix it on the fly, right? If they, they didn't take the time to test it beforehand, you know, some teams did, some teams didn't. Um, if they hadn't tested it beforehand and didn't know that till the day of, then you got like 10 minutes to fix it. Um, so rubber bands, hot glue, basically turn your slick wheels into something that has treads on it and traction. That's why uh, auto racing, right? Uh, Formula One, NASCAR, all those things, they have many different types of wheels depending on the track they're running on, the temperature, whether it's rain, all of that changes the wheels they put on the car. And that changes the race, it changes everything. So um, you gotta be flexible and you gotta pay attention and really do your research on, on what's going on and how to prepare and, and how to react. Do we have any other questions? All right. Uh, we don't have any other, other, any other questions as of yet. Okay. Um, I'll Jump back over here to my computer. Switch my camera around. So share my screen again. This is the website for the program. If you're interested in more information, um, it's got my contact information. It's got the, a link to the videos I showed you today and some others. Um, it's got information on the next tournament. If you want to come down in April, April 23rd, to see the next round, or if you want to sign up and bring your class, um, form a, an after school club, whatever the case may be, there's a sign up form and a contact form for me to help us get you get you started. Um, and it, it, I really mean that, help, you, help us get you started. I'm not looking to just invite you and, and have you come down if you're ready to do that, that's great. But um, uh, we're really interested in, in helping get groups started and get them off the ground running and, and see what they need to, to do it. Um, so to that end, Again, I've got another site here with an inquiry form and the assembly instructions for the first step in the educational program. So with that, I think those are the major things I had to share today. Excellent, well, thank you. And, uh, and we did have a couple of questions that, that came in. Uh, so one of them is about the schedule. Um, how often do you guys schedule your competitions and um, are there more competitions or less competitions in the summer? Uh, right now we have two. We have April 23rd will be the next one. And then again in November, probably the first or second week of November um, next year. So um, yeah, we, as interest grows, I'll certainly look to add more, um, spread it out and, and do it a little more often. But I also have, there should be a, for, for any high school students you have in Big Brothers Big Sisters, um, I'm expecting to offer a high school summer one credit college 
high school to college transition class uh, for one week over the summer as part of our STEMI. Uh, it's actually STE squared M uh, program. It's a summer one credit for juniors and seniors in high school um, class that'll get, let them get started on earning college credits early. So awesome. And, and so one of the questions that did come up and I'll, I'll, ask, I'll extend that to, to your program as well. Uh, what is the cost um, to get the battle bots going and, and for somebody to participate um, with that college credit program? Uh, I believe the college credit program is a $250 class. Um, the, the middle school, high school program that I'm running, it's about $100 for a robot. Um, so far, I've been running it through Mesa, which is a STEM program around New Mexico. And um, they've been helping cover the cost for the school to buy the parts. Um, so if you're interested, I'll try and help you find the money to get the parts. Right? If, I, if I get 300 schools that all want parts next week, I, I don't have that much money. <laughs> If it's more manageable than that, I'll, I'll work on, I'll work with you to figure it out. I've, I've got some that are financed by, you know, alumni of the schools and things, and some that are funded by Mesa, and we'll figure it out. If you got kids that are interested, we'll figure out a way to get them building robots. Awesome. I think a lot of our kids will, will definitely love to learn that they could, uh, they could build robots, uh, robots that are fighting. <laughs> And, and let me ask you guys this, uh, and this goes out to, to Curtis and Thomas, um, what do you like most about your time, you know, doing work with the battle bots or, or is there something that's, that's part of it that just really strikes you as like, wow. <laughs> um, I can take it first. Um, so I, you know, I spend most of my time doing, you know, work on stars and with my day job. And so getting a chance to step out of my office and get a chance to work with amazing kids doing such cool projects and, you know, share my love of science and technology and engineering with them. It's just really cool to be able to be a part of this program and help bring it to you guys and help judge the competitions. It's, it's, you know, I, I it's a very creative thing that our students and our middle school students are doing. And it's just great to see every single day, all the creative stuff they came up with. Yeah, I would, um, I, I would say it's working with the students. It's why I'm an instructor down here at New Mexico Tech is I came down here after my graduate studies and got to work on a research project alongside some of the students and they were just great to work with. So I stuck around until I could find a teaching job here. Um, it, it, I love working with the students here at Tech. I love working with the high school students and the middle school students from around the state. Most of it we've been doing on Zoom, uh, call in and offer assistance to the teachers in the classrooms um, just so that we can reach further than we could drive. I, I can't possibly drive to all four corners of the state in a day, um, but I, I want the program to get out there to as many as students as want it. Awesome. And so uh, I think this will be our, our last question and we'll get into like last comments, but, uh, but this is a fun one. So I like this question. This comes out from Joey and he's asking, when will the battle bots take over? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've seen Terminator, huh? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. These, these ones can't do that. Um, one of the things we talk about in the coding is the robot knows nothing until you tell it something. It's just sand, right? Computer chips are made mostly of silicon, which is sand. Um, until you tell it what to do, it doesn't know anything. We've got to tell it the pins that are in it, what the wires connect to. We've got to tell it what kind of signal it's getting. We've got to tell it when it's sending out signal. So, until... Uh, we would need artificial intelligence, right? These these bots don't have that, um, where the bot starts to learn on its own. Um, so I'm not too worried about Terminator. <laughs> oh, 
Awesome, awesome. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for, for sharing more about the, uh, the wonder of New Mexico Tech and the awesome work that you guys are doing with BattleBots. And uh, as we close out today, do you guys have any words of wisdom or any encouragement for uh, the young students watching or, or the audience watching as well? Yeah, I say ask questions. Ask questions about everything. Um, learn math and start to look for how it applies to things, right? We couldn't drive this robot if we didn't know a little bit of algebra. Not a lot, but a little bit. Adding, adding and subtracting, multiplying and dividing variables. We need that much to tell it what kind of signal to send to the two wheels to drive it. Um, so look for ways that what you're learning in school applies to the world around you, right? Engineering is really just that, taking our knowledge and trying to shape the world around us to better serve us or better serve the environment or, you know, not always better serve humanity. <laughs> yeah, I'd echo that and just say, you know, don't be afraid to break stuff. Don't be afraid to get creative and have fun. Physics is all about learning how the world works, which is what I do. And, you know, being able to see how the world works is just, it's awesome. And, you know, I, I you know, don't be afraid to ask questions and just sort of explore. Anyone can be a scientist is what I always say. And so, same thing goes to engineering make sure you get out and test things and you know just explore and build and have fun awesome well thank you very much uh dr curtis and soon to be dr thomas <laughs> we, uh, we really appreciate you all joining us this morning and again just sharing your time and sharing your wisdom and just sharing this this cool work that you're doing down in socorro so Everyone, uh, that will go on ahead and conclude our exhibition with New Mexico Tech and the uh, wondrous uh, physics of BattleBots. Be sure to stay tuned tomorrow and see our uh, other presenters, which will be on. And uh, with that, we'll go on ahead and conclude and uh, highlight some of our sponsors who helped make uh, Discovery Fest 2021 possible. Thank you and uh, have an awesome Thursday. <laughs>